Hi everyone, welcome to our lecture on synchronous generator control. Uh, today we'll talk about two main controllers that synchronous machines have, uh, the governor as well as the excitation system. Okay, before we get started uh, with our discussion on different types of controllers that generators have, let's uh, spend a couple minutes to fully understand what we expect from a synchronous generator. A synchronous generator is a rotating electric machine. It consists of a stator, which is a stationary part, and a rotor, which is the rotating part. Now, for the sake of this example, imagine the rotor is a salient pole, um, and it has a winding wrapped around it as well. This winding is connected to an external voltage source, V of F. Uh, now the rotor itself is mounted on a shaft which is connected to the prime mover, in other words a turbine, could be a steam turbine or a hydro turbine. So as the turbine rotates, uh, the shaft rotates and the rotor which is mounted on that shaft will rotate with the same speed. Um, so we rotate this with a speed of omega s and that will be the frequency that the generator will provide for us. Uh, the stator has three connections for phases A, B, and C, and it will be injecting active power uh, into the grid and either injecting reactive power into the grid or drawing reactive power from the grid. Uh, we usually show this as an um, electrical equivalent circuit, and we often model uh, the voltage induced in the armature E of A, which is the internal voltage of the generator, the voltage um, induced and generated internally in the machine. This voltage, of course, is not the, the voltage which is um, uh, seen at the terminals of the generator because the generator is going to have losses. We model these as armature resistance as well as synchronous reactance. So whatever remains from that E of A will be reflected on the um, output side of the generator at the terminals, and we show it as V of T. Uh, again, I put the tilde here to indicate that this is a phaser. Now, I sometimes show this field winding here with the voltage V of F to indicate the connection between that voltage and the voltage that is induced in the generator. Um, and of course, I have my shaft, which is rotating with a speed of omega s. Now, for a generator, there are two things that are important for me. The generator has to be able to maintain the desired voltage magnitude at the terminals. In other words, V of t. And it also has to be able to maintain the frequency of the system, which is omega s. The frequency of the system is related to how fast or how slow the rotor is being rotated. Um, if the frequency is low, by spinning the rotor faster, I can increase the frequency. And if the frequency is high, by slowing it down, I can reduce it. So the frequency that I see in the output of the generator is directly proportional to that speed. And the, the entity, the, the, the controller that is responsible for maintaining that speed is the governor system. The governor system looks at the frequency at the output of the generator, and if needed, it'll try to speed up or slow down the rotational speed to maintain the frequency at the desired level. The role of controlling the magnitude of the terminal voltage, on the other hand, is on excitation system or the excite. What the excitation system does is it monitors the voltage magnitude, and if it's low or if it's high, it tries to adjust the internal voltage to bring V of T back to, for example, one per unit, which is desired. Take a look at this uh, equivalent circuit here. If I write uh, the KVL, it would be of the form VT tilde, uh, EA tilde equals VT tilde plus RA plus J X of S I of A. Uh, so if, for example, uh, the current, the load current I of A changes, resulting in changes to VT. By changing E of A, you can counteract that and bring VT back to the desired value. And in order to change the magnitude of EA, the internal voltage, the 
guy that will help you out is this VFF. So what you will do is you change the voltage that is applied to the field winding. Through that, you will change the internal voltage of the generator. Through that, you are able to uh, change the terminal voltage. So to recap, there are two things that we expect from a synchronous generator. Maintain a constant frequency and maintain a constant voltage at its terminals. The job of maintaining the frequency is on governor and the um, system that is responsible for maintaining the voltage is the excitation system. And our plan today is to talk about both of these uh, different controllers. Collectively, uh, this is how the controllers of a generator look like and are related somehow to one another. Uh, this is your turbine. So this is your prime mover. And as you can see, it is mounted on the same shaft on which the rotor is mounted. So by rotating the turbine, what we can do is we'll be rotating the rotor of the generator and hence generating a voltage at a particular frequency. Uh, let's first talk about the governor. So the governor system is the controller that monitors the frequency at the terminals and then based on whether it's high or low, it adjusts the rotational speed of the prime mover. If the frequency is low, it forces the prime mover to run faster so the frequency increases and the other way around. Um, it also receives another input, uh, which is delta P of ref. So basically it's changes to the uh, set point of active power uh, for the generator. If again, your delta PRF is positive, that means you're forcing the generator to inject more power into the grid. And if it's negative, you're basically reducing the amount of power, active power that is, that the generator is injecting into the grid. And all this, again, is done the same way by making the prime mover going faster or slower. Uh, you notice that this delta P of ref uh, is something that comes from the outcome of a different system. This is the AGC system, the automatic generation control system. Um, and the AGC system looks at different things. It looks at the variation of frequency from the reference value, which, for example, is 60 hertz, and also looks at uh, the scheduled power transactions through the tie lines of different systems that are connected to one another. And this is a, a topic for our future lectures. We're not going to be talking about that today. But just remember it this way, that collectively the error in the amount of uh, frequency and error in the amount of power that is going through the tie lines collectively will generate an error signal, which we will then use through different controllers to generate this delta P of ref. Again, this is something that we'll talk about later on. So I just wanted to, wanted to touch it at a very high level. The next uh, controller that we have is my excitation system, which is also known as the exciter. And here the idea is uh, that you measure the voltage at the terminal of the generator. You compare it with the reference value, which is typically one per unit. And the difference um, is basically the error that you feed it into the excitation system. Um, and uh, forces the field voltage to go up or go down in order to make sure that VT remains at one per unit. Okay, let's uh, start our discussion uh, by considering the governor system. Uh, now, while today our focus will be solely on the governor system, uh, let me just give you like a very quick overview about the AGC system, as I showed you on the previous slide. This AGC, or Automatic Generation Control, um, is a controller that is not local, it's centralized. And it interacts with the local controller of the generator, which is the speed governor. So it helps produce a signal, additional signal, delta P ref, which will then be applied uh, to the governor. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we will not be talking about AGC today. Uh, but just at the high level, the objectives of AGC is to make sure that the frequency is regulated within the acceptable range, which is um, plus minus 0.3% error. Uh, in other words, 60 hertz plus minus 0.02 hertz. It also tries to make sure that all the power transactions through different tie lines that are connecting multiple systems to one another 
are based on the scheduled values. Um, and oftentimes what happens is uh, once you um, run economic dispatch or optimal power flow, for example, and determine what the output, uh, the power output of each generator would be, you will apply these commands uh, through the AGC to the governor systems. Uh, so AGC is responsible for all these different objectives. Uh, in order to get a better sense of what we're looking at in terms of timeline, and let me uh, reduce my or remove my image so you can see this better. Um, here, um, as we talked about before, when you want to control a power system, first in a day ahead approach, 24 hours before the dispatch day, you run unit commitment. Unit commitment here determines uh, what units have to be on at every hour of the day and how much power they have to inject. Naturally, since you're doing this 24 hours in advance, um, your information about uh, demand, for example, is not, is not very accurate. So what we do is, uh, while this is done 24 hours in advance, as we get closer to the dispatch moment, about an hour before or 30 minutes before, something like that, we run economic dispatch. During economic dispatch, we have a better idea about the actual demand. And of course, if you have renewable energy resources like PV and wind, uh, whose output is not deterministic, here we have a better idea because we're getting closer to that dispatch moment. Uh, but as you can imagine, demand even, even if you consider a few minutes before the uh, dispatch moment, it's still not you know, uh, known with 100% certainty. So what we do is, again, a few minutes, about you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes before the dispatch, we run OPF. Um, at this moment in time, we have an even better information about the demand. And in addition, uh, not only we update the active power commands of individual units, we also run the full um, power flow equations to indicate also how much reactive power each generation, generation unit has to inject or draw from the network. This information is now being pushed into AGC. Now AGC in a uh, minutely time frame receives this information and applies it to the governor system, which is kind of the last part of the system uh, with a secondly operation time frame. So governor um, works every couple of seconds, AGC every couple of minutes, OPF every few minutes, economic dispatch every more or less like half hour to an hour, and unit commitment every 24 hours. Okay, let's uh, shift our focus uh, to how we can model the governor system. The governor system consists of two main parts. Uh, one is a servo motor which receives inputs, one of which is the delta F, which is the variation in frequency with respect to the, the rated value, the reference value, which is 60 Hertz. And the other one is delta P ref, which is typically coming from the AGC system. The servo motor receives these two and then determines uh, through a network of levers and hydraulic systems, how much it should open or close the valve that is controlling the flow of steam into the turbine, uh, which is this valve here. Uh, naturally, because opening or closing a valve is not an easy task to do, we take advantage of the power provided by hydraulic systems. So we have a main cylinder in which we have a piston, and this piston is connected to the valve, so by pushing up or down, it basically tries to either close the valve or open it further. This is the whole uh, idea behind the speed governor. By receiving these commands delta F and delta P ref, you decide how much you should open or close the main valve. Naturally, if you open the valve, you will have more steam getting into the turbine, so the turbine is going to be running faster. And if you close it further, that means the amount of steam that gets into the turbine uh, would be less, so it will be running slower. Okay, in order to model the speed governor system, let's uh, start with the servo motor. The objective of servo motor uh, is to receive these inputs, delta F and delta P ref, um, one from the local measurement of frequency, which is delta F, 
and the other one delta p ref coming from the AGC. Based on uh, what the values of delta f and delta p ref are, the servo motor would like to help either open or close uh, the valve uh, to the turbine, uh, which is this guy. Um, so what, what this servo motor does is it either pushes this point A down or it pushes it up depending on the input signals. Think of this as a lever, this rod as a lever, and imagine that the fulcrum of this lever is somewhere in between points B and C. Um, and uh, for you know, demonstration purposes, I am assuming that this is the direction for positive X. Now, I have two inputs. One of them is delta F that I define as the difference between the actual frequency minus the scheduled or reference value, which is 60 hertz, and the other one is delta P ref. Imagine uh, that my delta F is positive. If delta F is positive, that means the frequency is higher than 60 hertz. So what I would have to do is I would have to close this valve so that less steam gets into the turbine, or by the way, I keep mentioning about steam, the same applies to hydro turbines. So you can think of it as less water getting into the hydro turbine. Um, so what I want to do is I would like to close the valve so that less steam gets into the turbine. Uh, conversely, if delta F is negative, meaning that F is less than 60 hertz, I would obviously want to have higher amount of steam get into the turbine so the turbine starts running faster. The rotor as a result spins faster and increases the frequency. So if delta F is positive, what I can do is I can push the servo motor, in fact, can push point A uh, in the positive direction down. Uh, as a result, think of this as a lever with a fulcrum. If this part goes down, this part goes up, and this valve tries to close a little bit. Uh, and conversely, if delta F is negative, what I would do is I would push point A up, and again, think of this as your lever with a fulcrum and the valve will go down. This is how the position at point A is related to delta F. What about delta P ref? If delta P ref is positive, that means I would like to get more steam into the turbine so that this turbine runs faster and I, will, I can get more active power out of the generator. Uh, so if delta P ref is positive, I would like to let me use a different color for delta P ref. Uh, if this is positive, I would like this to go up and so that this portion comes down. And uh, conversely, if delta P ref is negative, I will push point A downwards so that the valve tries to uh, close. Uh, so it seems like the change in position of point A is related to whether delta F is positive or negative but its relationship to delta P ref is with the opposite sign. I can show this as delta X of A, change in position of point A, is some K1 times delta F minus some K2 times delta P ref. Next, uh, let's consider this uh, delta B. Delta B, uh, de delta, uh, sorry, X of B. Uh, so the position of point B, if, if the lever is a rigid body, um, you can write the position of point B as a linear combination of position of point A and position of point C, which is what I'm showing here. So these are the two equations that we have for changes in positions of point A, points A and point and, uh, B. Next, uh, let's uh, shift our focus uh, to this cylinder and the pistons. Essentially what happens is if point A goes down, what will happen is these pilot valves will also move down, let's say like this, and then you will have an opening here for the high pressure oil to get into the main cylinder. When the high pressure oil gets into the main cylinder from below, it'll push it'll, it'll try to push that piston upwards and if the piston is pushed upwards that means that this valve will try to close and uh, conversely let me use a different color here if point b goes up that means these pilot valves will try to move up a little 
So this, this valve is not accessible, but the high pressure oil will go through this path into the upper portion of the cylinder and uh, basically pushing the piston down. When you push the piston down, you're basically trying to open the valve. Um, the flow of oil, the high pressure oil that gets into that uh, cylinder basically depends on two things. It depends on, as you can see, what, the, what is the position of point B, X of B, and also what is the pressure differential between this high pressure oil and the oil that is trapped inside the cylinder. Now, this, of course, is a nonlinear relationship, but we can always linearize it in the vicinity of an operating condition. So we can say that changes in the flow of oil uh, would be related to changes in the position of point B and also changes in the pressure differential between uh, high pressure oil and also oil in the cylinder. Oftentimes, for simplicity, we ignore the pressure differential between the high pressure oil and the oil in the cylinder, and we only consider delta x of b. So we say that the amount of oil that gets into um, the cylinder only depends on the position of point b. The volume of the oil naturally would be dependent on the flow rate uh, times the time at which I'm considering the flow rate. So then what I can do is through a linear relationship, I can say uh, this change in volume of the main cylinder would basically be the changes in the vertical displacement, which is change in position X of C times the cross-sectional area, let's say the cross-sectional area of the cylinder. So that is the change in the volume. Again, that would be the change in the displacement of point C, which is here, times A. This would be equal to delta Q times delta T. Um, if I set delta T to be very, very small, I can then uh, divide both sides by delta T, and the left-hand side becomes derivative of delta X of C, which is now equal to delta Q divided by A. Now, through a series of uh, you know, manipulations of these different equations, if I try to get rid of uh, the equations that I had for delta X of A and delta X of B, um, and try to simplify this equation only in terms of delta x of c, which is the position of the valve, or, or rather changes in the position of the valve, um, and also the inputs to the system, this is the equation that I will get. A first order differential equation, which is expected because this is a linear system. Um, and what it's telling me is that this system has a time constant t of g, g for governor, um, has a gain of k of g, again, g for governor, and the input is basically a combination of both the changes in frequency as well as the changes in reference power. You do notice, however, in this equation, I have a negative 1 over r. This is the droop coefficient or speed regulation coefficient that is intended to uh, make the units of this term to be megawatt because notice that here the unit is megawatt here the unit of delta f is hertz i can't really add hertz with megawatt so in order to uh, be able to add these two inputs together i would have to um, have another coefficient which this coefficient for me is one over r and r has a unit of hertz over megawatt. So if I have hertz over megawatt and I have hertz here, uh, the, the two hertz units would cancel out and I will have megawatt, which I can now add to the megawatt value of delta P ref. Now that R, as I mentioned, uh, is known as the speed regulation coefficient or the droop coefficient. It's really a design parameter uh, that will basically tell you um, how much the output power of your unit uh, is sensitive to changes in frequency. Typically, the numbers we have is in Europe, it's set to 0 0.05 per unit and in US to uh, 0 0.06 per unit. To give you a better sense of what that means, uh, when the droop coefficient is, let's say, 6% in the US, it means that uh, if you use the entire power of your unit, it can change the frequency of the system by 6%. If, for example, you want to increase the frequency by 2%, then 
that means you, you need to use at least a third of the power, a third of the capacity of your unit. Um, now, that's the model, the simplified model we have for the governor system. Uh, the governor, as you saw in that uh, diagram, so we, if you recall, we had the governor system that would receive inputs delta F and delta P ref and then would basically try to control uh, the position of the valve. Controlling the position of the valve basically controls how fast uh, the turbine will run. So the next uh, element in line that we have to model uh, would be the turbine. This could be a steam turbine or a hydro turbine. Um, the way we typically model the turbine is that by uh, increase, by changing the, the valve position, what we can do is we can increase or decrease the amount of active power that the turbine is uh, is providing to the generator. Because again, remember that the turbine is connected to a shaft on which the rotor is also connected. Uh, so when um, my governor receives an input change in frequency or change in active power, what it does is it changes the position of the valve. Remember that point C in the previous diagram? That's the change in the position of point C is, is the same as the change in the position of the valve. By opening or closing the valve, your turbine is able to inject more or less mechanical power into the generator. Um, we often model this, similar to before, as a very simple first-order differential equation that we say the derivative of delta pm, the change in mechanical power provided to the generator, uh, is related to the input, which is position of the valve. So by changing the position of the valve, I can change the um, mechanical power provided to the generator. And of course, I do have a gain k of t, t for turbine, and a time constant t of t, again t for turbine. I have to mention that this is a very simplified model. In reality, turbines are highly nonlinear, um, and you have other dynamics to consider. For example, if it's a steam turbine, uh, you have to consider the dynamics of the boilers. A boiler is not a, a simple linear system. There has it has some nonlinearities associated with it. Um, and also, for example, if you have like a hydro turbine, uh, the water dynamics inside the penstock that again is something that this simplified model doesn't consider. But for our purposes, it's it's pretty much, um, you know, sufficient. All right, the last element that we have to model uh, would be the generator and the load, in other words, the electrical part. For the generator, we consider a very simplified model, which is the swing equation. Um, we're not going to get into a lot of details of this because it's a bit outside the scope of our discussion for governor system, but just to give you an overview, the swing equation says that uh, a generator receives mechanical power and then provides electrical power. The difference between the two indicates whether the frequency or the speed, both of them behave the same way, the frequency or the speed of the generator increases or decreases. So for example, if you have more mechanical power, so this is your generator, you provide mechanical power and it provides electrical power. If you provide more mechanical power into the generator than it's providing electrical power, the excess mechanical power will be used to speed up the generator. In other words, increase the speed or increase the frequency. Conversely, if, you if the generator is providing more electrical power than it's receiving mechanical power from the prime over, its speed will drop. So essentially it will slow down, meaning that omega m and the frequency will drop. Uh, now, for this equation, what we do is we convert it to uh, Laplace domain for simplicity. Um, and by the way, I forgot to mention that in this equation, I'm showing you T of M and T of E, which is the mechanical torque and electrical torque. But by multiplying torque by the speed, you can convert them to um, mechanical power and electrical power. Basically, uh, power equals uh, torque times speed. Um, okay, so if I convert this uh, to 
uh, into Laplace domain, uh, derivative will become a power of s. Uh, so it, it becomes the frequency in Laplace domain times s equals mechanical power in Laplace domain minus electrical power in Laplace domain. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time over these individual coefficients. There are some conversions involved to kind of simplify the equation. But basically what it looks like at the end is delta f of s, and this s means that this is in Laplace domain, and I'm using capital F to indicate this is a uh, variable in, in Laplace domain, not a time domain, equals 1 over sm times delta pm of s minus delta p e of s. Uh, m is the angular momentum of the machine and is defined as a function of the base power of the machine as well as the moment of inertia um, and the um, synchronous frequency. H, which is the inertia constant of this generator, uh, would be equal to the um, kinetic energy of the machine at rate at speed divided by the rate at power. Um, again, a lot of details, uh, which is uh, not what we're directly interested in. What we are interested in is that delta F, which is the frequency, uh, would be uh, basically determined based on the change between mechanical power and electrical power, or the load, uh, integrated, because 1 over S is an integration. Now, the very last thing before we can put everything together uh, would be the load itself. Um, electrical load in general changes over time. Part of this change is external, like, you know, um, as you add or remove uh, different demand points, the load changes over time. If I uh, turn on a device, turn on an appliance, the demand increases. If I turn it off, demand decreases. So this is an external change to the load. This is something that uh, does not have anything to do with the internal model of the system. However, there is another portion of load change which is internal to the system, and that is the variation of the demand as a function of changes in frequency. Demand in practice is related to frequency. How? Consider a, an inductive load. An inductive load has an impedance, Z, which is R plus J X, or R plus J omega L. So if I increase omega, what will happen is, obviously, omega L increases, and hence the magnitude of Z increases. Now, what is power? Uh, this power is going to be V squared divided by Z. So if magnitude of Z increases, the power consumption decreases. So as you can see, increase in frequency will cause a portion of the load to decrease if it's inductive. Now, as an exercise, you can do the same thing and see what happens uh, to capacitive loads, which, as you can imagine, when the frequency increases, uh, uh, basically the power consumption will go down. So delta P of load, changes in the load at any point in time, consist of two portions. One of them is the change as a result of change in frequency. If the frequency remains constant, delta F of T is zero, so I have no frequency sensitive load change. But when I have change in frequency, load part of the load as a result will change as well. So that's one part. Another part is just external changes in load, just random changes in load. Think of it as a disturbance as a disturbance which is coming from an external uh, source. Uh, so this is the frequency sensitive load change and this is the non-frequency uh, sensitive load change. Now, if you recall, um, I had come up with this equation, the previous slide, one over M times S, delta P M of S minus delta P E of S. Uh, delta PE and delta P load are the same. Electrical power or load in this context are the same. So here I can show it in the form of a block diagram. Delta PM minus delta P load. When I feed it through a transfer function of 1 over MS, it'll give me delta F. But at the same time, 
I know that delta P of load has two portions, one of them which is D times delta F, another one which is a delta of P load. And that's the external portion. So delta F times D with a negative sign and a delta P load with a negative sign. Collectively, that would be my delta P load as I'm showing it here. So this is the block diagram that I'm trying to model the generator. Now what I can do is I can put everything together in order to get the complete picture of frequency control loop in a generator. What happens, and I'm going to walk you through these different elements that we developed, what happens is I have two inputs, remember. One of them was delta P ref of T. The other one was delta F, but notice that it was scaled by 1 over R because delta F has units of hertz. By scaling by 1 over R, it, it gains units of megawatts. So this minus this, because there was a change in sign between the two, that will be the input that will be applied to my first element, which is the governor. Governor, we modeled it as a first order system. It was a first order differential equation, uh, which is basically the same as uh, a first order transfer function. Uh, you do, of course, notice that I have some boxes added here. For example, there is a limiter function here because um, access to boiler power is not unlimited. I have a upper limit, lower limit for the boiler. I have to include that. Or, for example, the governor has a dead band. It doesn't respond to any change uh, in frequency. There are very, very small changes in frequency. It kind of tries to ignore that because otherwise it have to be it's a mechanical system and it has to keep responding to any change which would lead to wear and tear so this dead band makes sure that for very small changes in frequency i'm just going to ignore it but for large changes i will respond to it so that's my speed governor the speed governor what does it do it changes the position of the valve so here i will have my delta x of c the changes in the valve position this uh, leads to l more steam or less steam into the turbine, or rather, more water, less water. Uh, turbine, I modeled it again as a first order differential equation, which is a first order transfer function. And again, you could have a limiter function here because a turbine cannot exceed a certain power, and it may not be economical for a turbine to produce less than a minimum amount of power. So there is a P min, P max involved. The turbine on the other hand, generates an output, which is delta P M of T. This delta P M of T minus the load, as I showed you in the previous slide, fed through the generator will give me delta F, which is the frequency. This is known as the primary frequency control system. Primary to distinguish it from the secondary frequency control system, which is the ATC. This system on its own uh, is not able to bring the frequency back to 60 Hertz. So if there is a disturbance, if frequency starts going up or going down, this system initially responds within a couple of seconds and will try to bring the frequency closer to rated value 60 Hertz. That's the key word, closer to 60 Hertz. So it's not able to bring it completely to exactly 60 Hertz. That's the job of secondary frequency control system that we'll talk about in the next lecture. Uh, but this is the system that provides the initial response within a few seconds, and then it waits for the AGC to kick in. Um, and again, if you recall, AGC has a uh, time frame of minutes. Uh, it tries to um, bring the frequency back to 60 hertz. Okay. So what we talked about so far was the governor system, which is responsible for maintaining the frequency. We also saw that another important uh, objective of a synchronous generator is to be able to maintain uh, the voltage. Um, in order to maintain the terminal voltage of the generator, we have to adjust the internal voltage, uh, E of A. Again, let me rewrite uh, the, the equation that we had, so E of A equals V of T plus R of A J X of S I of A. 
let's consider this, uh, this case. Uh, you have, let's say, an inductive load, so the current is lagging the voltage at the terminals of the generator, um, and basically your V of T, which is this line, plus, um, in this example, I'm assuming that R of A is almost zero, so ignore it, uh, V of T plus J X of S I of A. J is 90 degrees, so when you have I of A, you multiply by J and then shift it by 90 degrees, it becomes J X of S I A 1. And then this plus this would be your E of A, which is here. Now what happens um, if you increase the, uh, the load. For example, you go from IA1 to IA2 with the same power factor, but the magnitude changes. Uh, the KVL is still the same. So now what you have is V of T uh, plus JX of S IA of 2, which is this, this bigger vector because IA of 2 is, is larger. So that's the like JX of S IA of 2. Uh, this plus this becomes EA2. What does that mean? That means when the current increases from IA1 to IA2, if I want to maintain the same terminal voltage at the level of VFT, what I would have to do is I have to increase the magnitude of EA. And this is done uh, using the field winding. So essentially, if this is your a model for the armature, and this is your E of A, what you have to do is you have to increase your V of F so that magnitude of e, I, e of A uh, goes up. This is the whole idea behind the excitation system. So the excitation system uh, monitors V of T. Um, as low changes goes up and down, V of T might increase or decrease. Whenever it changes with respect to one per unit, which is typically ideal, what it does is uh, it changes V of F, increases it or decreases it so that the magnitude of EA changes in such a way that VT is brought back to one per unit. That's the whole idea behind uh, the excitation system. Um, typically, the excitation system has a a number of different uh, components. Uh, at the end of the day, um, what it consists of is this is your generator, uh, this is your where you have your internal voltage, and this is the field winding. Your objective is to measure V of T, compare it with the reference value, which is typically one per unit, and form an error signal. This error signal is then led to a controller, which is, we call it the voltage regulator. The voltage regulator generates a, an actuation signal, which is applied to the excitation system. Excitation system, uh, I will show you in the next couple of slides uh, what it looks like, but it's basically um, either another generator itself or, for example, a you know, powertronics converter. Uh, it may or may not have a stabilizing compensator as well. This is usually put in place uh, if the exciter is, is relatively slow. Uh, when the system is slow, it has some delays associated with that, and delay can lead to instability. So if that's the case, we would have to have a compensator to kind of compensate for that delay. Um, but if we ignore that because it's a little bit more detailed, think of it like this. You always measure the actual voltage with the reference value, form an error signal. This is fed into a controller. The controller, which is your voltage regulator, will generate an actuating signal, and the actuating signal is pushed into the exciter, will tell the exciter, generate this particular voltage for me. Now we have uh, different types of excitation systems. Uh, the oldest technology is the DC excitation system, which is was very common uh, up until the 1960s. What they do is um, the, the way they generate the voltage, the voltage for the field winding, is through another DC generator. So this is, imagine this is your main generator. This generator has a field winding. And the field winding has to receive some V of F. Somebody has to generate this V of F. And in a DC excitation system, that somebody 
was another DC generator, which of course is a lot smaller. So what happens is you measure the voltage, uh, compare it with, uh, for example, here you will compare it with the reference value. This is your voltage regulator. It generates a signal and it will tell your DC exciter, which is like a DC generator, go ahead and produce this much of field voltage for me so that I can bring this voltage back to one per unit, for example. These systems were relatively slower and uh, more expensive because uh, since you have a DC exciter, you have brushes uh, in your DC generator and these brushes require maintenance. So that will uh, add to the cost of operation. A newer technology that come into play after 1960s was the AC excitation system. The concept here is pretty much the same, except that the excitation system that generates V of, v of F for you is not a DC generator anymore. It's an AC generator. So again, you have your main generator and your field winding. And let's say you measure the voltage here. You compare it with, let's say, the reference value. And let's say it's either over one per unit or under one per unit. What you then have to decide is I need to have a particular V of F applied to the field winding of the generator so that it changes my E of A, so V of F to get the E, I, F, e of A that I want, and then E of A in return will give me the V that I want, or V of T that I want, which is one per unit. Uh, so here, the, the concept again, as you can see, is pretty much the same as before, except that the output of the voltage regulator will go to an AC generator. So an AC generator, which of course is a lot smaller than your actual generator, will generate that V of F for you and then applies it to the field winding. The one thing you have to keep in mind, however, an AC generator, as the name says it, generates uh, an AC voltage. Uh, field winding, on the other hand, requires a DC voltage. So because this is AC at this point and you need it to be DC at this point, you have to run it through a stationary diode rectifier. Uh, so that you rectify to DC and then apply to the field winding. Uh, there are other forms of AC excitation systems. This is just one example. Uh, there are other forms that, for example, the, the rectifier is not stationary anymore and it rotates uh, on the shaft as well. Uh, the very modern systems often use static excitation systems. Here you don't have a rotational body for your exciter anymore. Uh, just like you had like a smaller DC generator or smaller AC generator to generate your VFF, here you skip that by using simply Powertronics rectifiers. So again, you have your main generator and you have your field winding. You measure your VFT, you compare it with VREF, and let's say this is not sufficient. So you need to have a certain amount of VFF applied to your field winding in order to get the VFT of one per unit. How you do this? Using a um, SCR rectifier. This SCR rectifier is oftentimes fed from the terminals of the generator itself. So this VFT using a transformer, the voltage level comes down so that it's appropriate for the excitation level. Then you have a rectifier uh, whose firing angle is being controlled by the regulator. And then regulator, by changing the firing angle of the rectifier, gives you exactly the V of F that you want in order to get one per unit. These systems uh, are much faster than uh, AC and DC excitation systems, uh, are a lot less expensive. Um, so a lot of modern systems are uh, moving in that direction. When it comes to the excitation system, there are different metrics that are important for us. Um, some metrics are important when the excitation system is uh, exposed to disturbances. Uh, these are known as a large signal performance metrics. Uh, two important ones would be what is the maximum voltage that the excitation system can supply during transients, and also what is the maximum current uh, that it can provide during the transient. So these are the two important specifications for any excitation system. 
Similar to large scale, large uh, signal performance metrics, we also have small signal performance metrics. So if, for example, the excitation system is supposed to go from, you know, some voltage level like 200 volts, let's say to 220, how does this transition take place? Um, as um, you probably remember, the transition is not instantaneous. Rather, you will have some oscillations. Um, and it's important for you to know first whether the system is stable. Uh, if it is stable, what are the stability margins, for example, gain margin or phase margin? And how does the time response take place? For example, what is my rise time? What is my settling time? What is my overshoot? Uh, these are the important small signal performance metrics that we need to know about the excitation system. Now, what I showed you in the previous slides, uh, although it it might look complicated, it actually was a lot simpler than what we have in reality. In practice, an excitation system is a lot more complicated. We have a lot of side objective functions uh, that help us ensure that the system is uh, stable and uh, do not jeopardize the physical health of individual components. These are some of the examples. So here again, you have your main generator and the field winding, and this is your exciter, which could be a DC generator, an AC generator, or an SCR rectifier. And this would be your regulator. But then you have other things. Uh, one of them is the excitation system stabilizer. Uh, this is what I mentioned to you in the uh, a, a few slides back. If the exciter is having a long operational delays, that could lead to instability. So you would use a stability compensator to stabilize and then basically speed up the response time of the, um, the exciter. You have overexcitation limiter and underexcitation limiter. Uh, these are put in place to make sure that you do not uh, inject too much reactive power or you do not draw too much reactive power because either one would be uh, very dangerous for the stability and health of the generator. So as whenever the amount of reactive power exchanged between the generator and the grid exceeds certain limits, the overexcitation limiter or underexcitation limiter will basically try to cap that level so that you don't exceed that. We also have a V over Hertz limiter. Uh, v over Hertz, a voltage over frequency, that is corresponding to the magnetic flux. Uh, so basically what you try to do is to limit the amount of magnetic flux that is uh, you know, flowing through the ferromagnetic materials of the generator. The reason here is that you want to make sure that you don't oversaturate uh, your, uh, your ferromagnetic materials, which would uh, lead to high eddy losses and hysteresis losses. You try to limit the maximum flux that is going through um, the ferromagnetic material so that the losses are less. Um, you also have a, you could also have a PSS, power system stabilizer. A PSS looks at during transients, it looks at the oscillations of voltage or frequency and tries to adjust the uh, voltage set point of a generator to counteract and battle those oscillations. So during faults, your V ref is not going to be one per unit anymore. In fact, PSS will try to change your V ref uh, to make sure that, for example, it fights these oscillations and manages to bring the system back to stability. And uh, last but not the least, we have the load compensator. Uh, load compensator, uh, essentially allows you to control a voltage other than the terminals. So for example, if this is your generator uh, and this is the terminal, and let's say this, this is a, a transmission line and this is a very important uh, load, using a line drop compensator or a load compensator, both of them refer to the same thing, uh, instead of controlling the voltage at this point, to be one per unit, one per unit, it allows you to control this voltage to be one per unit, if this voltage is more important to you. 
Um, so these are some of the you know side control and protection functionalities uh, that typical excitation systems have. Um, so this was kind of a brief overview about different controllers that we have for synchronous generators. Uh, these are the list of references that I used uh, for uh, this lecture, and uh, if you're interested, I encourage you to refer to them. They have a lot more information uh, than what we covered um, in this one-hour class. Uh, in the next uh, lectures, we will um, extend the notion of uh, primary frequency control into secondary frequency control, and we will see how the AGC system allows us to bring the frequency back to exactly 60 hertz after a disturbance happens.